In section 1.2, we look at the rectangular coordinate system. This should be a review for most of you. So if you take the two-dimensional plane and you divide it using two real number lines, a horizontal line and a vertical line, you get what we call a rectangular coordinate system. The horizontal number line is usually referred to as the x-axis and the vertical number line is called the y-axis. And those two lines divide up the plane into four areas. And these areas are called quadrants. And this upper right area is the first quadrant. It's quadrant one. Over here, we have quadrant two. Moving around, this is quadrant three. And over here, we have quadrant four. And what's significant is the point in the middle here, which is the origin, corresponds to x equals 0 and y equals 0. And so if you move to the right on this number line, those are going to be positive values for x. And if you move to the left, you get negative values for x. Likewise, on the y-axis, when you move up, you get positive values. And when you move down, you get negative values. So that's indicated by these arrows here. When you're moving to the right or upward, that is considered to be a positive direction. And if you are moving downward or to the left, that is considered to be a negative direction. Let's take a look at a few example points plotted in this coordinate system. So here I have my coordinate system, my x-axis and y-axis, and you can see we have various points that are plotted in the plane. And I don't want to spend too much time going over this because this should be review, but let's just talk about a few points here. So if we take a look at this point right here, this point corresponds to an x value of 1 half and a y value of positive 2. And you can see that when you look on the x-axis, this value here is about 1 half, and that's what that's corresponding to, and the value on the y-axis is 2. And we can do that for any of the points in any of the quadrants. Notice that when you are on the x-axis, the y-coordinate is 0, so this is the point 3, 0. And when you are on the y-axis, the x-coordinate is 0. And so this point has coordinates 0, 5. And of course, if you have points in any of these other quadrants, you're going to have a negative coordinate for either the x or the y or both. So if you need to review graphing points in the coordinate system, you should do that. But everyone should have a relatively thorough understanding of this. Next, let's talk about equations of lines. To write the equation of a line in the rectangular coordinate system, we have two formats that we use. We have the format y equals mx plus b, and this is called the slope-intercept form. And then we also have y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, and this is called the point-slope form. Now, in both of these equations, m is the slope of the line, and I don't think I'll spend a lot of time talking about this right here. Um, y equals mx plus b. B refers to the y-intercept, which is the point on the y-axis where it crosses. And in the other equation here, x1 and y1 represents any other point on the line, any known point on the line. So let's just do a couple of quick examples of graphing lines. So let's say we have, for example, the line y equals 2x plus 3. To graph this line, we have a couple of different options. One thing we could do, of course, is we can make a table of values where we pick two or three x values and find the corresponding y values. 
So let's go ahead and do that. If I pick x equals 0, if we plug in 0 here, we get y equals 3. If I pick x equals 2, y is going to be 2 times 2, which is 4, plus 3 is 7. And if I pick x equals negative 2, we get y equals 2 times negative 2, which is negative 4, plus 3, which is negative 1. And now I can use those points to sketch the graph of the line. So here I have a coordinate system. Now I'm just going to graph these three points. So the first point here is x equals 0, y equals 3. That is this point right here. That is also the y-intercept of the line. And then we have x equals 2, y equals 7, which is this point up here. And finally, we have x equals negative 2, y equals negative 1. And you can see that we can sketch the graph of the line which passes through these three points. And that is the equation of the line, or the graph of the line from that equation. Now, another way that we could have graphed this is we could have just recognized that the slope of the line is 2 and the y-intercept is 3. So the y-intercept being 3 means that it crosses the y-axis at y equals 3, which is this point right here. And then the slope being 2, let's just review that real quick. If the slope is 2, we can think of that as 2 over 1. And remember, slope refers to the rise divided by the run. So what that means is from our y-intercept, which is this point right here, we're going to rise up 2 and then go to the right 1. So we can see that slope visually up 2 over 1, and that gives us another point on the curve. And we can keep doing that, right? We can keep going up 2 over 1 as many times as we want. Keep in mind, we can also go down 2 into the left one. Because if you go down 2 to the left one, you get negative 2 divided by negative 1, which is still positive 2 for that slope. Okay? So we can actually graph the line by algebraically getting points on the line. Or we can use the graphical interpretation of slope and y-intercept. Let's talk about intercepts a little more generally. So an x-intercept of a graph of an equation is the x-coordinate of a point where the graph crosses the x-axis. The y-intercept of the graph of an equation is the y-coordinate of the point that crosses the y-axis. So one thing to keep in mind here is that when you're talking about an x-intercept, y is always equal to 0. And when you're talking about a y-intercept, x is always equal to 0. And this is simply because if you just imagine an x-intercept, which is a point on the x-axis, the y-coordinate there has to be 0 because it corresponds to y equals 0. And if you have a y-intercept, the x-coordinate has to be 0 for the same reason. So this actually leads us to a technique for finding an x-intercept and a y-intercept. So if I want to find the x-intercept for a graph, I simply let y be equal to 0. And if I want the y-intercept for a graph, I let x equal 0. Let's do a quick example. Suppose I want you to graph the solutions to the equation 5x minus 2y is equal to 20. So one thing I could do is I could solve for y and then make a table of values and pick x values and find y values like we just did a minute ago. But there is actually a much easier way to do this when the equation is in this format. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let x equal 0 to find the y-intercept, and I'm going to let y equal 0 to find the x-intercept. So when we let x equal 0, we're going to plug that into our equation here. 
That gives us 5 times 0 minus 2y equals 20. 5 times 0 is 0, so we get negative 2y equals 20. And if you divide by negative 2, you get y equals negative 10. And I can put that in here. And then in a similar way, I can let y equal 0. If y equals 0, we get 5x minus 2 times 0 is equal to 20. 2 times 0 is 0. So that gives us 5x equals 20, and that means that x is equal to 4. And that is our x-intercept. So this very quickly and easily gives us two points. We have 0, negative 10, and 4, 0. And I can use that to get the graph. So 0, negative 10 is this point down here. And positive 4, 0 is this point here. And if I connect those, and again, we only need two points to graph a line. That is what the graph looks like for that. So we could use this so-called intercept technique to graph the line very quickly and easily. Next, let's talk briefly about graphing parabolas. This is just a little refresher. So if you have an equation y equals a times x minus h squared plus k, where a is not equal to 0, the graph of this equation is a parabola whose vertex is at the point hk. And this vertex will be either the highest point on the graph or the lowest point on the graph, depending on whether a is negative or positive. Let's do a quick example. Suppose I want to graph y equals negative 2 times x minus 1 squared plus 4. So one thing I know is this is going to be a parabola that opens downward because my value of a is negative 2. And if a is negative, it opens downward. And the other thing is my vertex occurs at h, k. Now you have to be kind of careful here. This says x minus h. What that means is you have to take the opposite of this number when you're getting your vertex. So when I'm getting my vertex for this parabola, I'm going to take the opposite of negative 1, which is positive 1. And then for the value of k, you take whatever's outside here, and that happens to be positive 4. So our vertex is the point 1, 4. And again, we already know that our parabola opens down. And so what that means is this point here will be the highest point on the graph. Let's take a look at that graph now. All right, so the vertex occurs at the point x equals 1, y equals 4, which is this point right here. And we know that the parabola opens downward. And I am kind of assuming that you remember that a parabola is a sort of U-shaped graph, right? This one's going to be opening downward like this. Now, to get an accurate graph of the parabola, we should find a couple of additional points here. So what I like to do is make a table of values for x's and y's. And we'll get five points here. And I like to put my vertex right in the middle, which is the point 1, 4 that you see here. Now, to get additional points on the parabola, I'm just going to pick additional x values that are either to the left or to the right of x equals 1. So to the left of x equals 1 is 0 and negative 1. And to the right of x equals 1 is 2 and 3. So I'm going to plug in 0 and negative 1 and also 2 and 3 to get those y values. And all I'm going to do is plug those into our equation. So for example, when x equals negative 1, y will be negative 2 times negative 1 minus 1 squared plus 4. This is negative 2 times negative 2 squared plus 4, which is negative 2 times 4 plus 4 which is negative 8 plus 4, which is negative 4. Now, we can do that for all of the rest of these. And if we do, we get the following values. And if you want, you can take a moment to verify these y values here. But now I'm going to go ahead and graph those. So we have the point 0, 2, 
we have the point negative 1, negative 4. We have the point 2, 2. And then finally, we have the point 3, negative 4. And you can see that this makes a sort of U-shaped graph, parabola, which opens downwards. And you can see that the vertex here, this 1, 4, is definitely the highest point on the curve. So that's just a brief refresher on how to graph parabolas. And that will come in handy just for some of the other graphs that we're going to do in this class as well. Next, let's take a look at graphing circles. The general e equation for a circle is x minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals r squared, where ab is the center of the circle and r is the radius of the circle. Let's consider an example. So in this equation, we have x minus 2 squared plus y minus 3 squared equals 16. Once again, AB is the center. So when you see the negative A and the negative B here, what that means is that you need to take the opposite of whatever appears here. So the X coordinate of the center is positive 2, and the Y coordinate of the center is positive 3. So we have a center of 2, 3. And then the number on the other side, 16, this is equal to R squared. So let's keep in mind that 16 is the same as 4 squared. And so this means the radius is 4. Now to graph that, all I need to do is bring in a coordinate system. And then we first graph the center, which is at the point x equals 2, y equals 3, which is right here. I'll put a C there for center. And then to graph the circle now, we are going to move four units from that center in all directions. So we go four units to the right, four units to the left, four units up, and four units down. And then we just do our best to sketch the graph of the circle. So pretty simple. Let's do another one. This next one is kind of a special case. Notice that it's a bit simpler. We have x squared plus y squared equals 9. Now keep in mind that x squared is the same as x minus 0 squared, and y squared is the same as y minus 0 squared, and 9 is the same as 3 squared. So what this means is that we have a center of 0, 0, which is the origin, and the radius r in this case is equal to 3. So this is a circle whose center is at the origin. And to graph it, I'm just going to go to that center, which is 0, 0. And we're going to go three units in all directions. So three units to the right, three units up, three units to the left, and three units down. And we'll just sketch the circle. Now I do want to talk about one more special circle and that's called the unit circle. The unit circle has the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. The center of the circle is at the origin, and the radius equals 1. So the unit circle is centered here and passes through the points one unit from the origin in all directions. And so it looks like this right here. So it looks a lot like the last circle that we graphed, except that the radius is equal to 1. This is a really, really important circle. And we'll be talking much more about the unit circle later on in the course. The last thing we need to look at in this section is angles in standard position. So what is an angle in standard position? The simple answer to that is an angle in standard position is an angle where the initial side is along the positive x-axis and the vertex is at the origin. So let me bring in a graph and we'll talk about angles in standard position. So an angle in standard position is going to have its vertex at the origin and its initial side will be along the positive x-axis, which is what I'm sketching right here. 
So they always start with this ray. Now from there, we can begin to rotate either counterclockwise, which would give us a positive angle, or we can rotate clockwise, which would give us a negative angle. Let's suppose we rotate counterclockwise and we stop somewhere over here in the second quadrant. So in standard position, that angle would look something like this. And I'm not gonna concern myself at the moment with the size of that angle. I just want you to get a feel for what this angle would look like when it's in standard position. So we're rotating this way, okay? And we'll call this angle theta. Now what we know is that theta terminates, it ends in the second quadrant. So I can write that down, theta terminates in quadrant two, okay? And then another way to say this a little bit more succinctly is just to say that theta is an element of quadrant two. So this means the same thing. This is just the more mathematical notation for saying theta terminates in quadrant two. And by the way, we can do this for any of the quadrants, no matter where it terminates. So this is how we indicate what quadrant an angle is in, okay? Now, I also want you to notice that I could have graphed, say, this angle using a negative angle, and I'll call this angle alpha, just to give it a different name. And it is true that alpha also terminates in quadrant two. And you should also be able to see that theta and alpha have the same terminal side, okay? But they are not equal to each other. Theta is not equal to alpha, because again, theta is a positive angle and alpha is a negative angle. But they end at exactly the same spot. So when they have the same terminal side, what we can say is theta and alpha are what we call coterminal. So they are coterminal angles. And that just means that they're not equal to each other, but they end at exactly the same place. So in a way, even though they're not technically equal, they are kind of equal. They're kind of the same. That's going to be important later on. Now we have some special angles that we can graph in standard position, and these angles are called the quadrantal angles. Quadrantal angles are angles that terminate at the dividing line between two quad quadrants. So for example, 90 degrees is a quadrantal angle because if you draw it in standard position, we have the initial side here and we have the terminal side here. So you notice that it terminates not in quadrant two, not in quadrant one, it's in between quadrant one and quadrant two. It divides the two quadrants. So it is what we call a quadrantal angle. And of course you have a quadrantal angle at 180 degrees, you have a quadrantal angle at 270 degrees, and also 360 degrees. And by the way, we can keep on going and going round and round, right? So for example, if, if I take 90 degrees and I add 360 degrees to it, this gives us an angle of 450 degrees. So 90 degrees looks like, like this. 450 degrees would just be going around to 360 and then continuing 90 more degrees. So we should see that 90 and 450 are coterminal angles, right? Because they end at the same place. And they are both quadrantal angles as well. Okay, let's just graph a couple more angles and then we'll be done with this section. 
So here I have three angles that I would like to graph in standard position. The first one is alpha equals 210 degrees. Excuse me, that's theta, not alpha. Then we have alpha equals negative 120 degrees. And finally, beta equals 315 degrees. So to graph these, we're just going to get an approximate graph of where these angles would be located. So to graph theta equals 210 degrees, we're going to start in standard position here on the positive x-axis. And we're going to rotate to 90 degrees to 180 degrees. And of course, we're not going to quite go to 270 degrees because 210 is somewhere in between 180 and 270. In fact, 210 degrees is 30 degrees beyond 180. So I would say that 210 degrees might look something like this. Just an approximate picture. Next, we have alpha equals negative 120. So again, we are going to start in standard position. And this is a negative angle, so we are going to be rotating clockwise. If I rotate clockwise down to here, this angle would be negative 90 degrees. If I continue, this angle is negative 180, and then this is negative 270, etc. So negative 120 is beyond negative 90, but not quite to negative 180. And in fact, it is 30 degrees beyond negative 90. So negative 120 degrees would look something like this. Finally, beta equals 315 degrees. To graph this angle in standard position, we will start on the positive x-axis. This is a positive angle again, so we have 90, 180, 270. 315 is more than 270, but not quite all the way back to the beginning because if we go back to the beginning, this, of course, would be 360 degrees. So we need to stop short of that. So it's going to look something like this. So we're going to 90, 180, 270, 315 degrees. Okay, so this is what beta looks like. This is what alpha looks like. And this is what theta looks like. Now, again, we're not trying to measure precisely when we graph these angles. We're just trying to get it down to locating the angle in the correct quadrant and rotating in the correct direction. And this concludes 1.2. Actually, hang on one second. There is one other thing I need to discuss, and that is the distance formula. So you've seen this formula before, but I want to be sure to remind you of it. The distance between two points P and Q in the coordinate system, where P has coordinates x1, y1, and Q has coordinates x2, y2, the distance between those two points is given by this formula. So quick example, let's suppose that point P has coordinates negative 3, 8, and point Q has coordinates 1, uh, 2. To find the distance between these two points, we're going to take a big square root. We're going to subtract a couple of x values here, and we're going to subtract a couple of y values here. Now, don't get too caught up with whether it's x1 or x2 or y1 or y2. All you have to do when you subtract your x values is just subtract in the same order that you subtract your y values. So for example, P has a y, an x coordinate of negative three, Q has an x coordinate of one. I'm going to do negative three minus one. And for the y values, P has a y coordinate of eight, Q has a y coordinate of two. So I'm gonna do eight minus two. And from there, we just complete it, do the math. Negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4 squared. 8 minus 2 is 6 squared. This is the square root of 16 plus 36. 16 plus 36 is 52. So we have the square root of 52 
you could leave that as your answer, but the square root of 52 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 13. So you can simplify this to 2 radical 13. That would be the distance. And of course, you could plug that into a calculator. And when you do, you get approximately 7.21. Depending on whether you want your answer to be exact or approximate. All right. That is the distance formula. And I think I just want to do one more example for you here. So in our last problem, I want to solve for x if the distance between the point P, which has coordinates x, 5, and point Q, which has coordinates 3, negative 3, is 10 units. So again, we use the distance formula. Distance equals the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Now, in this case, we know the distance is 10, so we can fill that in. And then on the other side, I'm going to fill in the subtraction of the coordinates. So again, just make sure you subtract in the same order. So for my x values, I'm going to do x minus 3. And for the y values, I'm going to do 5 take away negative 3. So notice the double negative there because y1 is, is negative if I choose to subtract in that order. So what we end up getting here is 10 equals the square root of x minus 3 squared plus 8 squared. And if you want, you can multiply out the inside of the radical here. So x minus 3 times x minus 3. If you square that out, you get x squared minus 6x plus 9. Plus 8 squared is 64. And that gives us 10 equals the square root of x squared minus 6x plus 73. Now, the easiest way to proceed from here is to get rid of the radical by simply squaring both sides. And when we do that, we get 100 is equal to the inside of the radical. And from there, I can subtract 100, which gives us 0 equals x squared minus 6x minus 27. And from there, we can factor this factors pretty easily into x minus 9 and x plus 3. And finally, we set each of those factors equal to 0, and we get x equals 9 or x equals negative 3. And these are both solutions, right? Because if, if you think about it, what does x represent? x represents the x-coordinate of a point, and x-coordinates of points can be negative. Now, why is it that we get two answers? Let's just take a quick look at that. So point Q was 3, negative 3, which is this point here. And point P was x5. Now, x5 means that the y-coordinate is 5. If the y-coordinate is 5, it's somewhere up here. Okay? So point P has to be somewhere on that line. Now, we ended up getting two solutions. We got x equals 9, which means that you would have the point 9, 5. And we also got x equals negative 3, which means you would have the point negative 3, 5. Now, if we graph both of those points, 9, 5 is this point right here. And negative 3, 5 is this point right here. And you can see that we get two solutions because we can be 10 units from P to Q in this direction, or we can be 10 units from P to Q in this direction. So that is why you have ultimately two solutions for X. Okay, this concludes section 1.2.